In order to be what we are, we have to come out of what we are not. Now then, here you and I are sitting in a body. Now in a few years this body will die, go back to dust. Am I the body? Is this what I am? I live in it. If I raise my hand, I raise my hand, but am I the body? What am I? He was a quiet man, an artist, a craftsman, very conscious of his surroundings, a landscape artist mostly at that time. So he taught me to observe nature, to see the beauty of what was in front of me. Nothing elaborate, just the hedges, the trees, the grass. To notice the sky. He was also very conscious of good work. He loved carpentry. He taught me how to use tools. And I remember so well him saying, pay attention, keep your eye on what you're doing. When you're sawing a piece of wood, listen and watch the move listen to and watch the movement of the saw. Watch the hammer so you hit the nail straight. And these two lessons of one hundred percent giving attention and observing what was around me have stood me in good stead all my life. Mum was Russian. Well she was also an artist in her way. She was a housewife, of course. Um, that's what women were then. <laughs> they called themselves there and were proud of it. Mum was always, <laughs> when women's lib came in, she, she said, there's nothing wrong with being a mother and a housewife. <laughs> anyway, well, what I got from Mum was primarily a Russian heart. And Russian hearts, they just spill out all over the place. Mm -hmm. I was always told as a child, I wear my heart on my sleeve. Well, people laughed at me, but it's one of the best things to have a great heart and to, that, to recognize the existence of the heart. And, uh, and the whole household shone with that tender, loving care that emanates from a, someone that loves their work and gives themselves to it. The way the table was laid, the way she knitted our clothes for us, did the mending, did the washing up. Everything was a work of art and done with love. It was a shock because up till then we lived in the deep country and I hardly knew what another little boy was. Um, my companions were nature and animals and I was suddenly thrown into this world of other little boys and I was completely lost and for the first time in my life I knew what it was to feel isolated and lonely. Thank God the school was in a rural setting, so there were big gardens where I could go. And, and, uh, and also, in my little childish way, I remember so well just burying my little head in my hand and closing my eyes and saying, God bless Mummy and Daddy and my sister and our dog. And what a haven of, a haven of home and security that was for me. Yes, I think that probably was so, um, or if not inside, at least to stillness and quietness. I mean, in nature, it's outside, isn't it? You look at a tree, you put your arms around a tree, and you're held in stillness, in quietness, in that reassurance of, of just simply being itself. That's what a contrast it is to the, the noise and the... And the the agitation that you get from most people. Well, I wouldn't say that, no, it's really a book to dis uh, committed to discovering, well, I don't know what really, it's, uh, if I use clever words like the infinite and, or even God, it, as a young man I wasn't, I still don't know really what they are, who doesn't know what God is? <laughs> Nobody knows what God is, but, but there's, how can I put it? Perhaps one longs for the unlimited, for freedom, and uh, 
and for love. And in in worldly experience, all these things are finite, they have an end. You go out, you discover freedom, go out and climb a mountain, but then you've got to come home again. Love is wonderful in its flowering, but then sooner or later it says no, it has an end. Um, all the things you long for happiness, it all comes and goes, doesn't it? And I think uh, perhaps I was just greedy, I wanted that which didn't end. I wanted to make the world a better place. Well, it was, uh, I wouldn't say it was easy, but uh, it, it, there was plenty of space up there and I loved that. I loved the donkeys and the oxen. And uh, yes, I, I was, I was, it was a good year. I, but uh, I think like most people who've done voluntary service, <coughs> it, uh, I learnt, it gave me much more than I gave to it really. And I learnt probably the greatest lesson of my life. I remember sitting on a mountainside one day. I, I'd done a lot of work, a little bit of work with planting trees on eroded mountainsides. And of course the local sheep and goats had come and eaten them all off and I was sitting there a bit depressed. And it seemed that some, a little voice seemed to say to me, to make whole, be whole. Make whole. To be make whole, be, be whole. whole. Well, I hardly understood what that was then. But I had read a little bit about meditation. Not that I really understood it. But I saw myself as a mixed up young man trying to help people, the local Indians, older and wiser than myself and more able to live. And I realized I had to do something about sorting out myself before I could be much use to others. So having read a bit about meditation, when I came home to England, I looked for and I found a school of meditation. Well, I've, I've, I've had many years of practice. It's just second nature to me now, probably my first nature. It's so obvious we're sitting in it like fishes in the sea. You can never not be still. But the trouble is we just don't see it. We, we, we look down and we just live in this cocoon of, bit of mental agitation, lost in thought. That's the human condition, at least what we call the human condition. But actually it's, it's lost. It's not, it's not reality at all. It's not what we are. And this is the cause of all our problems. We're absent from the presence of God. The present is, is such an important word. Now, the present moment, here and now, the present moment. You can hear the church clock chiming, can't you? I can. It's sounding in stillness, isn't it? It's one o'clock. In yeah. stillness and in timelessness. Time goes round, yeah. round and round, in eternal presence the peace of God that passeth understanding, right here and now. We can never be closer to God than right here and now. It certainly was very important. <coughs> yes, I had to go to London to be taught. I was taught. Um, the first practice, I, I, I still, I had a, my first farm was at Bakewell then, so I had to get the late night train back from London to look after my animals next morning. And I was sitting in St Pancras Station waiting room, among all the rubbish and the unfortunate drunks and homeless that, that, that used it. And I, I sat and closed my eyes and meditated as I'd been told. And there and then, in that seemingly uncongenial situation, it opened up like that. And I realized that all the space, the freedom that I longed for, that I'd been traveling the world to find in the deserts and mountains of this world, were within me. And that discovery that and that discovery, well, it's been going on all ever since. Bigger and bigger, greater and greater, better and better. It was the beginning of realization. Yes. Of course, I had the theory. 
I was, I was brought up in a Christian school. I, I, I had 10 years apple and scripture lessons. I, I knew a lot of the Bible by heart and the old prayer book. The kingdom of God is within you. I, you know, I'd learned that, but what did it mean? I didn't really know. But, but very soon in those first few periods of meditation, I realized that there was this dimension that was not of this, or not of what we call this world. There was a, 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 a further dimension that could be realized. That's the word, realization. Mm. You know, the, the, the biblical phrase comes alive. Um, the kingdom of God, what does that mean? Well, I don't know, it's difficult to say even now. But, but it's within you, it really is within. And the peace of God that passes understanding, it's beyond the thinking mind. You, you, you don't get it by, by, you know, substituting one thought for another, but by opening up to this dimension of spirit, really. That's what it is. Invisible. You can't describe it. But everybody knows what silence is. No one can describe it. I know I used the word when I described it. I'm not sure really what I meant by it. Um, I think the words Jesus and Christ so often get used with very nebulous meaning and different people, of course, mean, mean it in different ways. But I think what I, how I would describe it now, as far as I remember, it was a realization of this, of this stillness. That, there in the, that, that this underground carriage was, was full of this stillness. And within this stillness, the bodies, the personalities, the sounds took place and actually pervade, pervaded everybody. Yeah. I mean, if you look at people's eyes, every, every eye shines with more or less light, even if the eye's very dulled. It's the same light, isn't it? How many lights are there? There's only one light, isn't there? <laughs> and uh, um, so it is, there's only one stillness, there's only one spirit. And, and, and I think that these uh, first experiences of mine um, were like that. It depends what you're focused on. There are levels of consciousness. Um, you know, if your heart is light, if your heart is full of light, you see light, and everything that's in it is light. You know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, isn't it? If your eye is full of beauty, that's what you see. As I, as I said, being a country boy, I was, I, was, um, I was at that time very negative about, about city life. Yes. That was the, sort of the worst of the worst. <laughs> you know, we used words like townies to describe those not fortunate enough, enough to live in the country. And civilization was the very, very um, antithesis of nature. Unnatural, wasn't it? And, uh, and so th these were some of the, the great lessons I had to overcome. And, uh, and certainly meditation did help to clear out some of those negative thoughts yeah. from my mind. But unfortunately, there are many, many more of them deeply buried inside. It's a long process. Um, yes, I, I don't remember too clearly what my motivation was. I think, uh, I think Perhaps it was a reaction, uh, you know, I just didn't want to be what most of my contemporaries were. I didn't want to go into business, I didn't want to go into the professions. Uh, I didn't... Um, monastic life seemed to offer a, an alternative. But it, that, was, that was about the same time that I learned to meditate. And it certainly raised the question, do I follow this way or the way of meditation? I don't see any conflict now, but then I did. It seemed an either-or situation. By the way, at that time, um, things have changed a lot in the last 50 or 60 years. The church was really quite suspicious of meditation. It, um, you know, it, it, uh, it regarded it as something Eastern, which is really very odd, <laughs> but it did. Um, I suppose I was caught up in that. But anyway, I decided to stay with meditation because even in 
those early months I realised, or I felt it was, at least for me, a more effective way of spiritual work. Excuse me, may I just jump back for a moment to make a, 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 a little comment about that decision about meditation. Um, the accusation is often made that meditation is a withdrawal from this world, but absolutely on the contrary, the pr key principle of the method of, that I taught was that you practice it while living in the world. A, a monkey's life may possibly be considered a withdrawal from life, from worldly life. But meditation, absolutely not. It's, it's the art of finding the eternal in the midst of, in the marketplace, the stillness in the movement. To be, I forget the exact phrase, but to be, I think it's in the world, but in not the, of the absolutely, world. Absolutely, that's, that's, yeah. that's the good phrase, in the world, but not yeah. of the world, yes. I understand and it's that. utterly practical yeah. and it's absolutely not a withdrawal and opting out of all of it. Yeah. It's a completely that's different understanding. I think it's one of those wonderful things I've got no explanation for. But um, at that time, one of the great loves of my life are sheep. Um, I could tell you a lot about my understanding of the Lamb of God. <laughs> anyway, um, at that time I had a, a, a quite a considerable flock of sheep, about 150 sheep, and I uh, had uh, five rams, I think. And uh, one of these rams was an old warrior where he, through much fighting, he'd split his skull and was <laughs> um, old soldier. Um, and just before uh, th things happened, I had to sell, move on from my first farm. Um, and I was sitting at one side of a field. I'm not sure if I'd been crying, but I was very unhappy about it all, losing my beloved man am animals. And, and these rams were lying under a hedge on the other side of the field, about, I suppose, a hundred yards or so away. And, and to my, my amazement, one of these rams, this old warrior, he stood up, he left the others. Slowly and deliberately he walked across the field. He laid his head in my lap and just stood there for a, a minute or two or three. Mm. Then he turned away and went back and laid that day with his companions. Mm. It brings tears to my eyes to tell you. Well, what do you make of that? Oh, well, I had a second farm then. It was a, it was a lovely little farm. That's really another story. And I, I was, a, I was happy as a farmer. I was married by then and had a good wife. Um, but we had many meditation students at that time used to come to the farm. I was quite well known as one of the first organic farmers. Um, there was a woman that came to meditate. And on one occasion, we meditate with closed eyes, by the way, we, we were sitting together. We'd, we'd just come to stillness. And I saw our two souls rise from our bodies and merge as one. She was a woman with very open, clear eyes. And when I looked at her, I saw right through to the infinite beyond. Well, you've got to realize there are two sorts of sight. There's the eyes of flesh, and there's what's called insight, seeing with the eyes of the heart. Insight is always limited. I mean, fleshly sight is always limited. It has a boundary. Flesh sees flesh. But we all have, to some extent, a, a sense of even indescribable beauty or indescribable peace or something like that. What did I see? I saw the indescribable right there. I saw the infinite indescribable. But it's the realest of the real when you see it. 
Mm. And what really tipped me back into, tipped me into depression was that I was still a young man, a hot-blooded young man, um, still, you know, very much living in my physical body and, and my, my human emotions. How do you reconcile the two? There was that spiritual uni union, if you like, the mystical marriage, contrasted with two people living lives, both with their own marriages, their yes. homes, their jobs, yes. that were not, that were separate. How do you reconcile unity with separation? Um, well, I couldn't at that time. It was beyond my, my ability, my experience. Mm. I couldn't go back into that old life. Of course, I couldn't escape it either, really. I was sort of imprisoned in it. Mm. You know, I, I went back home. You know, and there was my dear wife, and, and but somehow it was all too small. I couldn't sort of, I'd, I'd been shown something. Well, anyway, the gist of it was, it threw me into a turmoil of emotions, and and uh, and I left. I, I, I had to really break away, so I you left. You had to my, leave your marriage. I, I left my farm, yeah. I left my home. Wow. I, 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 uh, I had a little, one of the early motor caravans in that time, and I drifted around for some years, homeless, jobless, loveless, and alone. Mm. And um, it was a, a wretched time of life. I just picked fruit, I did what I could. But how can one access it? Well, meditation, of course, does just that. Because in meditation, you, if I can give you a demonstration, the beautiful demonstration of meditation. I hope the camera can see my hands. It's just that. You see? It's just an opening. It's letting go. That's right. Letting go. Now yeah. this is how we live. Forgetting, forgetful of yeah. the Try one. To hold on. Of the one. We hold yeah. on. Yeah. We hold on to our personal life. And so we're imprisoned yes. within our ego, which is our sense of separation. Yes. Mm? And in meditation, it starts very gently at first, so it's, it's not frightening or anything, but very gently it sort of helps you to do that. Yeah. Now, when you let go, you discover that you're not actually separate at all. You're united. You're in that which is undivided. Indescribable, but undivided. There's not two at all, there's just one. Mm. One love one person, singular. Adam in the paradise was singular. One. One I am. Now that's what I'd been shown in this dramatic episode with this woman. The oneness. Um, well, you could say that then the work, the real work began because the two polarities had been clearly identified to me. Well, I, in, well, I was too muddled really to put it as clearly as I'm saying to you now. But that's what gradually dawned on me. At, at one time with the motor caravan, I went and spent a winter in Spain, alone of course. And I spent hour after hour after hour just meditating. I, mm -hmm. I, I moved from just doing the standard half hour, morning, morning and night, and meditation became salvation. Because in salvation you're taken out of this imprisonment and you're shown what's real. Mm. You're, you're, you're saved from drowning in this world. Just like St. Peter was walking on water, he was drowning in the world. Mm. There was Jesus free beside him. Peter was drowning. He reached, he said, help me. Jesus said, what were you frightened about? What were you drowning for? Have faith. Have faith. That's what it's all about. Yeah. I had this wonderful practice, and this practice is such a wonderful way of putting it into practice. So twice every day, without fail, and for increasingly lengths of time, I was just surrendering to that total presence mm. 
and to and to that love that has no end, to that love that never says no, to pure total love, which is which I'd seen in her eyes, you see. Well, the body was a portal because yes. that, of course, isn't really what we are. And this yes. is the great discovery, that man is not limited to the flesh. The flesh, as the Bible tells us, is profit of nothing. Yes. The flesh is just, is just... Look, anything that dies, mortality, the whole world that comes to pass is not what we are. Man is eternal being. But in yeah. a way, it isn't difficult because it, it's it's a way. In a way, it's like when well, it's been described as a trail of grains of sugar. You know, it, it's it, it, you follow it because it leads. It's always leading you from better to better to better to better. From better to better yes. to better. It's it's described yeah. as a trail of sugar. You see, yeah. leading to the sugar mountain which is, of course, the kingdom of God. You know, one of the, I think one of the impediments, one of the things that stops us setting out on the spiritual life is that we're not sufficiently unhappy. We're too content with this sort of compromise with life, with all the little, you know, sandwich bars and baubles that life, you know, offers to us, the comfort of a teddy bear. Um, and, you know, for some people it's not good enough. You want more, you want the real thing. I guess I was one of those people. Well, yes, that's also true, and, 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 and am I not blessed? Um, there is a blessing in that, you're absolutely, absolutely. right. You know, yeah. the, sa the, as the Bible tells us we are saved by grace. And yeah. what is grace? It, it's something that comes unseen, unknown. You know, it's like memory. Where does memory come from? Yes. It just comes, doesn't it? I, I was... Uh, I was offered a job out in Africa, South Africa. I went out there, but the job didn't work out. So, uh, so after some time, um, I hired a little a little car, and uh, I just drove off. Um, I didn't really have a plan. I, I didn't even have a proper map, but I just followed the road, and it all unfolded in front of me. Um, I slept uh, in the back of the car and uh, or out on the out on the ground under the stars. Um, oh, I, I I absolutely loved it. The space, the glorious space, and uh, I you know I I I, I, uh, I never went to any big towns. The little ones, I just bought what I had to buy and got out into the open again. <laughs> I just found the big empty spaces on the map and I went there. I suppose I no, out there I, I think I, I was so thrilled by it. So... Uh, utter silence. Yes, yeah, so uh, I just couldn't get enough of space and silence. I've always loved space. Yes. Space and silence. They're, they're just natural to me. I belong there. That's where I feel at home. When I was a boy at school, my favourite picture was of a cowboy riding up to the crest of a hill with the caption, don't fence me in. I loved that phrase. And Africa was, oh, it was in that sense. Um, yes, and then I went on, I was in the Kalahari in the Namibian desert and, and that, uh, oh, I just loved it. I, it, it, I, I always... It always sort of seemed to me obvious why the early, the early Christians, you know, why men of prayer went to the desert, and then I experienced it for myself, and and it, it's it's just all so obvious there. It's all just before you, the infinite, and you are nothing. You you're just taken into the immensity of of what's there. Surely all that dies away. All the personality is just nothing. Yes. Yeah. The the me, the John Butler, is just. You forget about it. It's just nothing. Yeah. Well, I, 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 uh, you know, I'd lost my job as a farmer. I, I, I had to. I, I was desperate to find some sort of work, and um, for what on earth could I do? I, 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 I wrote a CV at that time, and uh, I remember more or less what I wrote. I wrote. I wrote something about. 
I knew something about freedom and therefore I could help others to freedom. Um, and of course freedom is, is love. Love is freedom. The two are the, really the same thing, spiritually speaking. And uh, if someone could give me a channel for, for my love, I'd give my all. That was what I was looking for, and of course, <laughs> who answered my CV? Yes, <laughs> nobody. <laughs> I was looking for, I was, I was looking for, for freedom in the world of bondage. Well, I suppose I hadn't. I see, I was still. We're such spiritual infants, you know. Even now, as an old man, I'm still a spiritual child, spiritual child yes. it's a long journey yes and and one's learning all the time you learn something every day and at that time I was still grappling with questions that I had that I that now I no longer have these problems but at that time I did um, how did I deal with it well how oh indeed I'm not sure that we can deal with it, because you see, we, I, am the ego. So it's the ego trying to deal with the ego. Yes. It's the pot calling the kettle black. Mm -hmm. The blind leading the blind. We are saved by grace. Well, I meditated. Um, at that time, I met a teacher, a young man, and I looked in his eyes and I had that ex same experience of seeing the infinite beyond. You have with that woman. Freedom, yes. yes. Yeah. And I followed him out to America, yes. to San Francisco. I was that desperate. I knew that's what I wanted. I didn't want anything else. Mm. And so I, as it were, jumped off the precipice to him. Mm. And while I was in America, after I'd been with him a few days, I remember there was a big meeting and he looked at me and, uh, and he pointed out my pride, my arrogance and my egoism, which was completely crushed me. Mm. I was exposed in this room of, I suppose, a couple of hundred people. And I felt within me a monstrous, almost like a worm. And I didn't know what to do with it at all. I was absolutely terrified. And I fled. Mm -hmm. Where did I flee to? I fled into the wilderness. Mm -hmm. I, I, I got a car and I just drove into the desert. And I thought I was going mad at that time. I had this, such a sense of evil within me. I didn't know how to deal with it at all. I meditated, but somehow even meditation didn't deal with it. And fearing I was really going to lose my, lose, lose my wits, I, I took a job as a cook in a, in a, in a funny little uh, uh, motel gas station. And I worked in the kitchen there, um, frying eggs and things. You want me to go on? And this was in the Mojave Desert, which is just on the border of Arizona, um, surrounded by desert country. One day, I, I, after work, I walked up the side of the valley. There was this little motel, there was a little spot down in the bottom of the valley. I sat on a rock, and I think I, I, I put my head in my hands, and I think I just, I just was finished then. And someone came and stood beside me. I didn't see anybody, I didn't hear anybody. No, no man was involved at all. But I felt there was a, a presence beside me. And I, I, I said, I, 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 I suppose it was Jesus. Mm. I've never doubted it. It was nothing to do with the church, nothing to do with religion at all. Mm. 
and uh, I didn't really notice any difference. Depression didn't end, but I wrote a poem, that's right. Depression didn't end, but from then on I had a friend. Huh. So I certainly didn't have any human friend at that time. Yes. And, uh, and then a few months, more months passed and I, I ended this job with a pocket full of money so once more I hired a car and had a wonderful time exploring the western states, the cowboy country and more animals and more beloved prairie. <laughs> then I came home and once again back in this awful abyss of... Um, Soon after I got back, I had some, some friends then that did healing and, and I remember they prayed over me and it was extraordinary. I found, I felt myself screaming. I was thrown to the ground yeah. and something was expelled. Some revolting thing came out of my mouth. It opened my mouth so wide that my mouth split. But what came out? I never saw anything. Mm. I suppose one idea expelled by another. And just before that happened, actually, I'd been, um, I'd gone into a job centre and I was invited to an open day and I was invited to go to Nottingham University to study Russian as a very mature student. Well, <coughs> What a thing to do. Why should I, a farmer, <laughs> a lover of open spaces, um, want to study Russian? Well, I was that desperate. I'd been um, homeless, jobless, loveless and alone for a long time. <laughs> and I was, I was really desperate to, for the direction for something to give myself to, not just aimless wandering. So I was only too grateful when I was given this opportunity. Um, yes, Mum was Russian. She was <coughs> she was born before the revolution in 1904 in Siberia, and uh, the family was dispersed, and she found herself a, a refugee sent to England in her late teens, speaking no English, and had a difficult life. Um, until she met and married Dad. But anyway, I'd always felt that I wasn't really English. I felt I was really a misfit. <coughs> I suppose that's why I was more at home with nature than with other people. School tried to make me into an Englishman, and it didn't really work. I didn't fit that mould. I didn't think that way. And I didn't know why. I suppose it was, it made me, gave me a sense of guilt and failure throughout life, that I just felt I was different, I didn't belong. Um, and when I began to study Russian, in very little ways at first, something seemed to come together in me. Somehow the, the even the language books, the illustrations in the language books seemed to just go straight to my heart. Something seemed, even though Mum never taught us Russian, by the way, because she was so traumatized by her own dreadful experiences mm -hmm. as a young woman, that she really wanted us to, to protect us from that. She, and she didn't want us to carry the weight of, of all those terrible events that happened in Russia. So she shielded us. But especially as I grew older, I wanted to know more and more. And when I went to university, I really was, was, was hungry to discover all I could about, about where I came from. It's another long story. Um, well, I, I went there at the end of Perestroika, the Iron Curtain had just come down. And uh, I, I found myself in a small town in provincial Russia, and I was a novelty. I, I was the only uh, Englishman there, the first most of them had ever met. The, the children wanted to learn English, and so naturally I found myself drawn into schools and teaching. 
I'd never taught before. I had no experience of children, but it wasn't difficult. I loved it. All I had to do basically was speak English. <laughs> well, that came later. Okay. But to begin with, you may remember it, I, I'd gone through a long period of depression, really yes. awful depression. And thank God being busy and being given something else to think about at university pulled me out of that. And when I went to Russia, again it was very difficult at first, I, my language was terrible and I, I, I was alone, I had nowhere really, so nowhere to live. Um, but eventually I found my feet and, and, and I and I loved it really. I, I couldn't help loving it even when I was lost and lonely and awful because I remember very soon after, soon after I went there standing at a bus queue on a cold, miserable day with a wretched lot of people all huddled up in their overcoats. And I felt such happiness. <laughs> Again, I'm going to cry because I knew I was among my own people. And these were people who thought and felt as I did. Yes. And I was no longer alone. I was among my own people. Yes. I can't tell you what that meant to me. Mm. And, and so it was a journey of great discovery for me. In love is not big enough word, really. No. But, but again, that was at the human level. And yes. So it was important at that level, at the level of my personality, but it, it's, it's of minor consequence compared to the spiritual work. I suppose at that time, I'd, spiritual work had rather gone into the background for me. Um, I was absorbed in the discovery of Russia. But after several years in Russia, I began to, uh, at first, Russian churches seemed very strange and alien to me. It's, it's quite different from the English church, at least the way it's presented. And I had to learn another language, not even ordinary Russian, but what's called Old Church Slavonic, to, to read the prayers and that. But I did it. I, I plodded on and, and figured it out and learned to read the simple children's books at first. And to my, it was like a rediscovering Christianity for the first time, really, rediscovering it. An extending of the background, rather than the, rather than the, the spirit, the spiritual work was not noticeably increased or improved. But the Christ but I'll tell you, sorry, let me tell you. Quite soon after, I told you when I started to meditate that the church greeted it with suspicion. And in a way still does. Yes, I think for yes. most church people, meditation is something yeah. they don't understand and they feel a bit uncomfortable with. Yes. Even here in Baycourt Church, I feel that, that it's, it's something that most church people really they don't quite un understand. Yeah. I sit there with eyes closed, what is he doing? Why doesn't he do something? Um, but when I went to Russia and started studying orthodoxy, I understood that what's called the Jesus prayer, which is the orthodox version of meditation, is very alive and part of the orthodox tradition. Through communism, for three generations, Christianity was virtually abolished in Russia, three generations of persecution. 99% of Russian churches were closed, desecrated or destroyed. Millions of Christians were martyred for their faith. I saw with my own eyes the miraculous resurrection of faith in Russia. And I was right there at the beginning of it. And my own discovery of this tradition of inner prayer meant so much to me because I was no longer an alien from the faith that I'd been brought up in. It okay. brought Christianity and meditation together. So what is the Jesus prayer? Well, the Jesus prayer uses, some people will be cross with me for saying this, but, but it, basically the Jesus prayer uses the name of Jesus as a mantra. Yes, okay. Now, um, do you want me to explain what a mantra is? 
I've explained how we live in this sort of bubble of thought. The human condition is basically 99% of the time lost in thought. We yes. live here. You have your bubble of thought, I have my bubble of thought, and so we think we're separate. And divine freedom or spirit, we need to discover what's beyond thought. It's a bit like on a cloudy day we live under a blanket of cloud. Hmm? Now what happens in, on a cloudy day? You get in an aeroplane, you go up through the cloud, and beyond the cloud you discover the beautiful open sky. Now that's what meditation is. Meditation and a mantra is like an aeroplane. You get in, a, in, in this, in, you sound a mantra, and it's, it's uh, like a sound in your mind, and it's like a mental handrail which leads you through this world of thought, of subjective thought, up to the open yes. sky. Now then, um, there are all sorts of mantras and methods of meditation. Some are, people have their choices. But if, you, if you're brought up in the faith, if you have a love of Jesus, if you have any sort of connection with Jesus, it's a very comforting thing to, uh, to use the name of Jesus. And uh, we, uh, of course, we grow in faith, really very childish concepts of what it's all about. And you go on growing all your life, you never stop growing in faith and in understanding what it's all about, what Jesus is. My understanding of Jesus is, has expanded enormously from what I understood when I was being taught about him in scripture lessons at school. And. Um, so anyway, it brought meditation and Christianity together. Mm -hmm. There are many levels of consciousness, aren't there? There's unconsciousness, there's consciousness of the body, of appetites, desires. Um, um, there are states of dreaming, states of awaking. Um, there's daydreaming. Most of us go through the day half asleep. We're not awake at all. Um, Occasionally, you, something noise disturbs you and you wake up. Good God, what was that? And you wake up to a higher level of consciousness. Where was I before? Oh, I was half asleep. Now, we go up and down like a yo-yo throughout our day between these different levels of consciousness all the time. And, and spiritual development is really moving to higher levels of consciousness. Just like an aeroplane goes up, it starts on the ground, and it goes up through thick clouds, more wispy clouds, to where there are no clouds at all. It goes up through clouds of the mind, which you can describe thoughts as clouds of the mind, because they're limited, they all have a boundary, and you can, be, you can describe them. And it takes you through to the indescribable, to the unlimited, which is spirit. Now spirit, spirit, what is God? God is spirit. <laughs> and it's all right here. All these states of consciousness are here. Here are you yeah. and I sitting in bodies, talking, and it's all within this context. Whether it's political correctness or what, I don't know, but for some reason the word sin has been largely missed out of modern life. But I'd like to give you a very simple understanding of sin. Now look, if I sit, if I stand like that and I look at the light, my face is lit, isn't it? I'm in the light. Hmm? Now if I turn around like that, my face is in shadow. I'm in darkness. And what I see is in shadow, the works of darkness. Hmm? Now, there is the light and there is darkness. This is the presence, the presence of the light, the presence of God, and this is absence. And our human condition is absence. Adam fell from the Garden of Eden, from Paradise. He fell in consciousness to a lower state of consciousness of absence from the presence of God, absence from the presence of God. And this is the human condition. 
and what are the oh, and, and this is what's called sin. The blind leading the blind, that's why we need education. We turn away from the source of life, so we get ill. And of course, the wages of sin is death. Everything that dies is sin. That's what sin is. Sin is death. Now, real life is what Jesus says, I am the light. He who walks in the light does not walk in darkness, but has the light of life. That's eternal life. That's what man really is, spirit, enlightenment. He lives in light. He lives with God. He walks with God. And this is absence. And, and all human shortages, poverty, desire, is because you're trying to make up for what you've lost. And so we try to fill ourselves up with other bits of darkness. And of course nothing works, it all has an end. It comes to an end, and then we're disappointed. And so we look for more things, but we're just playing with darkness. And all we've got to do is this. And what is repentance? That repentance is turning back to the light. It's so simple. But who's turning back to the light? Well, man has a choice. Now then, <coughs> In order to be what we are, we have to come out of what we are not. Now then, here you and I are sitting in a body. Now in a few years this body will die, go back to dust. Am I the body? Is this what I am? I live in it. If I raise my hand, I raise my hand, but am I the body? What am I? Well, let's take it a bit further. I think these thoughts, but my thoughts change from day to day. There's nothing consistent about thoughts. My emotions are all up, like a seesaw, up this way and that. The changing conditions of my life are here today and gone tomorrow. So what, what's left? If I eliminate what I'm not, what's left? Now you're looking at me, and <laughs> deep in your eyes is some sort of recognition. I can call it light. Well, we, the trouble is if we put a name to it, we limit it. But there is that unlimited, and that is what I am. What is the name of God? I am, that I am. How did Jesus describe himself when Pilate said, who are you? before Abraham was, I am. Mm. Timeless, spaceless, indescribable, pure being, being oneself, I am. That's what it's all about, discovering oneself, discovering what we are. And when we discover what we are, then we can be, begin to be of use. Well, it's... Um, Can I take you back to that sitting on a mountainside in South America to make whole be whole? If you laid a blanket on the ground and you picked up the centre of it and lifted it up, it pulls the rest of the blanket with it, doesn't it? Now, whatever we do affects the world around us, doesn't it? Um, smile in the world, smiles with you. And the raising of consciousness, which is really what we're talking about. You may not see the effect. Most other people around you may think you're just a silly old fool sitting there. But the raising of consciousness inevitably raises consciousness of what's around you. Just like when the sun comes in spring. You can't help it. Every plant, every blade of grass, every little bug responds. Well, really, prayer is the raising of consciousness. 
because of course in spirit there's no problem, is there? Nobody dies, nobody's ill, nobody's but hungry. But to begin with, of course, like at the bottom of a mountain, everything seems different, doesn't it? Lots of different paths. <coughs> Prayer is generally taken to mean, at least in the Western Church, um, an appeal from someone who is separate to God who's over there as a separate entity. So we say, Lord, have mercy, or something like this. Um, I'm the sinner, there's God. So we start off from separation and we usually pray for some object, some other item of separation, make mummy better or something. So we're playing with separation. We're still in the world of separation. Now, as long as we stay in this verbal um, expressions of, of separation, well, uh, that's how it is. Wishful thinking may or may not have an effect. Does it influence God? Well, how can I answer that? How do I, do I know? But eventually, you may say less words and do a bit more listening and just sitting there, just feeling the presence of God. Or maybe not. Now, meditation starts from a slightly different place because instead of, of using words to express thought, or desires, or even faith. You don't use words, apart from a mantra word, which is really a symbolic word. You let go. So you're really letting go of separation. The aim of meditation is union. Mm -hmm. So both, med both methods, prayer and meditation, if pursued, but I, uh, when I say pursued, it takes much time and practice and faith will bring you to union, will bring you closer to God. So really they merge, they become the same thing. But I know it's very confusing at the beginning because pr prayer, people think of these as, think of prayer and meditation as two different things. It's really just two different approaches to the same thing. I often feel the happiest, most blessed man alive. Amen. Must be wonderful. Yes, I You feel the happiest, most blessed man alive. Mm -hmm. And you know, I know what to do now. That awful question, what shall I do? I, I, I found the work. This is work, real work. Somebody dies, you know he doesn't die. Somebody's ill, you feel the wholeness. Mm. Something's poor, they're not, they're abundant riches all around. Everything is made whole. Now, people may not believe you. Well, that's the human condition, isn't it? This is what wise men have always said. It's all given to you. It's a gift. The kingdom of God is, is total. Yes. There's no need at all. Nothing dies, yes. nothing's ill, nothing's unhappy. It's light. And the wonderful thing, that all that I as a man fail to do, I now realise is is done by God, by Spirit. You know, I, I write books, and most people, of course, don't read them, but Spirit penetrates everywhere. In a way, even more so than sunshine, the real Spirit, it enters every heart. You don't have to do anything. All you have to do is remove the obstacle of me, my own blindness. You just have to come out of this blot upon creation, which is John Butler. This darkness with which I infect the world and create the works of dark. And when you let that go, which is full repentance, and totally thy will, not mine, abandon the ego, this is the demon within you, the devil within you, then everything that we try inadequately to do as people is done automatically by God. Okay, I think perfection is achieved. I think it's a wonderful place to finish. Mm. Thank you, John, very much for coming along and talking to us at Conscious TV. Just going to show your books briefly again. Wonders of Spiritual Unfoldment.
mystic approaches and two you've just given me destined to joy you pray for me thank you again thank you and thank you for watching conscious tv